<laughs> what? Oops. <laughs> Well, you're the last one up. You're muted. One, please. So who's yeah, the director really and who's the producer? They're walking around. All those guys with headsets. I think that's that my sounds, mic that does that. that I don't like know. See, I move my head. All right, well, uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, I'm already getting images from people sending in questions, so that's cool. Um, I guess the first thing, Charlie, if you want to open us up in prayer, and then we sure. can get into the questions. Okay. Father, we thank you again for such a wonderful time in our conference today and this weekend and Wednesday. And we are thankful that we've come to this point now to uh, answer those questions that uh, may still be uh, uh, concerning to those that are watching, that are here. And I pray, Father, that, uh, Lord, you give us uh, all wisdom, especially our, our speakers, to, uh, to answer faithfully and, and biblically all the things that are, uh, that are being asked. So we, we thank you for this time, and we pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've had an opportunity to be able to, to get a full weekend full of a lot of information. And so as most of you that are here know, there's no way that we could have gotten through all of the different possible topics relating to the end times, relating to prophecy, and just how we get to all of those things. And so what we tried to do with our speakers is we tried to get a wide range of topics but we wanted to have this question and answer session to just kind of cover some of the questions that maybe you had that didn't get brought up. And so one of the things that uh, I guess we had agreed that we'd start with is in light of all of this stuff that, that we've talked about, what do we do now? Like, what, do, what, what now? Like, how is that anything that we've learned this weekend, how do we apply that to our lives? What changes or what things should, should we be doing now? in light of all those things. So I don't know which one of you would like to go first on that. Well, I have ha had people tell me that this kind of stuff doesn't help them in their everyday life as a housewife or something like that. And so that is often thought, this kind of stuff is often thought to be irrelevant to some people. Well, it's not. Because, it, it, you know, it's just like understanding the Trinity. You know, how does that help me as a guy that goes to work every day from 8 to 5? Well, <laughs> there are implications that flow out of this. And knowing that God has total control over the future when you live in a world that appears to be chaotic, it gives you confidence that you can, and boldness if you're, thinking logically, to stand up for Christ, even though you may be the only one in a particular given situation doing that. Because we know ultimately Christ has won the battle and we're on his team and we're going to win. 
And that should give us confidence in nasty now, pie in the sky, in the nasty now and now, you see. And uh, so that is at least one aspect of how this should impact us. Somebody's I know, feedback a little bit. we're working on that. <laughs> um, I think I shared it on Wednesday night, um, but there are a number of passages that are just like uh, the one I think I read from Peter. Uh, you'll find it uh, in Titus and so many places when the topic is the days in which we live and the nearness of the Lord and his return. It, there's always an appeal for the person, the reader, to say, now considering the days, it'll be something like this. It'll be something like, considering the days, how should we be conducting ourselves considering the days? So when you, when you watch people kind of just losing their mind about the day-to-day -day of things, the last thing that the, the believer should be portraying to the world is being out of control and unbalanced like the world is. And actually having your head about you as you're engaging the world, it's great to be able to tell them about the things that are to come, the things that we've been discussing here, but doing so in such a rational way that you use it then as a platform to be able to preach the gospel. So um, of all of the things that, you, that we've read here, you'll watch people in the world who may believe some of the same things that we do as far as what they see. They know something is desperately wrong, but if they're not believers, their solutions are totally different. Our solution should be to turn them to the person of Jesus Christ because they were written for that very purpose. That we would be able to know that we're not operating in the dark so that we can say we know the things that are coming next and you can know as well. So you'll find that the appeal in the text is so common when, when um, the, the uh, uh, end times are being mentioned here. There is an appeal to the believer to be rational, to be measured in the things that you say, and to be very careful about message and about witness. And so that would be, you know, what do you do in considering the days in which we live? Make sure that you are as good of an example as you can be of a believer and make sure that your message is as pointed and direct as it can possibly be. I think that uh, there are implications that, you know, we've received that pertain to um, understanding the times in which we're living and then realizing that the call that Jesus gave us to go, to be evangelists, you know, to do the work of an evangelist, to always be light, to always be salt. Uh, because we don't, we really don't live in vacuums. I mean, we, we live next to neighbors. We live, uh, we work with people that we know don't know Jesus. And we may be the only light they have. You know, uh, there will be those that will be called into mission fields. You know, I, I don't know what the statistics might be about mission, world missions any longer. I mean, it, you know, we, we, we would figure that it isn't what it used to be. Uh, so our mission field is, uh, each and every one of us has one, you know. So it, it's, it's being able to have answers. You know, in other words, you know, scriptures even tell us, you know, Peter says we need to give an answer to every man. The hope that lies within us, and, and we have a hope, and, and that hope is the blessed hope, which is what we've been talking about here these last few days. So, Just simply, uh, I've heard that we don't need in most countries missionaries anymore because each, so many countries now have, are self-sufficient. You know, they have leaders Me, that could be another indication that we're near the end. Is that right. uh, it's not that there aren't people that need to hear the gospel that haven't heard the gospel, but we're not alone you know, anymore right. uh, as the primary sending agent here in the United States. Okay, I think that's a good, full-fledged answer there. Um, one of the, the ones that's come to us online is, will there be Jews that stay in Jerusalem that do not flee to Basra or Petra? And will those be the ones killed by the Antichrist as stated in Revelation 13.10? And how will Jews not living in Israel be protected? Well, 
we don't we don't know. The Bible doesn't give us information that enables us to answer that question. Uh, I don't know if the Jews that flee are believers yet, or if they're going to be believers, it, and things. Obviously, uh, at Armageddon, when they come to surround Jerusalem, there's there's apparently Jews there. You know, they're, they're going to destroy that. So apparently, that's a partial flee, perhaps. And yes, there's going to be Jews all around the world. That uh, you have, I keep getting back to the 144,000 Jewish witnesses from every tribe. 12 tribes, you see, and they're going to be, they're going to be like the Apostle Paul. And that's what I think what Paul meant when he said he was one born out of due time. Uh, he's one of the 144,000, so to speak, uh, that was born in the first century to help found the church. So you can imagine 144,000 Apostle Pauls out preaching the gospel. And then you have, as we said, the two witnesses in Jerusalem. So but that's the first half. They're killed at the midpoint. So, you know, it's hard to know exactly uh, the pro you know, a detailed answer to that question. Okay. Yeah, there's really not a lot to add to it. The, the Jews that you would see around the world, um, God's going to see to the needs of them as he would see the needs to any of the rest. Israel becomes the focal point, Jerusalem in particular, because it's Jerusalem, because it's Israel. Uh, that's why it's, uh, and the concentration of people who are there as well. So that's why there's so much focus in the text about that. But um, we know that the number of people that, that come to, to faith is, in, in that time, is just, it's unknown. It's massive. All right. Uh, the next one, what are some of the reasons that that you all would, would surmise why other churches don't teach the rapture. Not so much whether they, they hold a different view than a pre-trib, but why they avoid it altogether. Well, if you look at the history of the Reformation, for example, Calvin and Luther you know, were what's called, they continued the amillennialism from the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church also uh, believe that the church age is the millennium and uh, various things. So Calvin and Luther were fighting for the gospel. And I think if those guys were alive today, there's a good chance that they would be premillennial. Of course, they're not alive today. They're people of their time. But... It was the second generation of reformers that began to become premillennial. And you, you see this in the study Bibles where they, like the Judeva study Bible has notes about the conversion of Israel. And that was in uh, 1559 uh, when the first version of the Judeva study Bible comes out. And so then by the third generation of those uh, during the Reformation, you, you have an explosion Bible prophecy. For example, the Puritans that came here, they were all premillennial from what I've read. There's one of the Puritans that said we're all, and he used the term that they meant, that meant premillennial back then, we're all Kiliist. And uh, so it wasn't until the United, in the United States in the 1720s when Jonathan Edwards came along and Whitfield was probably premillennial, but he was the guy that big in the revival in the United States, whereas Wesley was big in Europe, and that was called the First Great Awakening. And so the denominations come from people coming from different countries where they had Protestantism, and it wasn't because people couldn't get along. That comes later, <laughs> you know, and stuff. And so um, what was exactly the question again? So I... I, I <laughs> So what, there's a lot of churches out there that okay. not only disagree oh. with pre-trib, but they just avoid the topic altogether. Right, because of their founding of their denominations at a time primarily when prophecy wasn't important, or uh, they become a liberal. You know, for example, Methodism never had, an, it had an emphasis on holiness. In 
it never had an emphasis on Bible prophecy. The, the denomination that was the most Bible prophecy oriented after the Civil War were the Presbyterians, believe it or not. And uh, almost all, for example, the founders of Dallas Seminary in 1922 were all, they were all Presbyterians. And they're the seminary that <coughs> produced, uh, that was dispensational and pre-trib, you know, and uh, where people that taught these views uh, came from. Of course, Dallas is gone by the wayside now. And, uh, but nevertheless, uh, that's the trajectory of schools and denominations. You start out like the Methodists, tremendous influence, and most of them are liberal. You know, they don't believe the gospel. They don't believe all these other things. And in fact, the Puritans, the, uh, the modern version is the Congregational Church. And that was, I read an article that said that they're the most liberal denomination in America now. That's where Jonathan Edwards and all those guys come from, you see. So it, it appears God has no grandchildren. Yeah. You have to get actually saved. And people grow up in these traditions and they're not actually saved and they so that shifts and focuses on the other side. That's why God raised up Calvary Chapel. And I don't, I don't know enough to know, but I'm sure Calvary Chapel has some problems. They've been around for 50 years now, you see. It's enough time. But you always got to be circumspect with these kinds of things. Yeah, so I guess I'll be the, the more prickly of the two of us when I answer this one and just say, <laughs> frankly, I think that you, you, you look surprised by that, Sean. I, I, I uh, would never <laughs> have guessed that you would be the prickly one. <laughs> I, would, uh, I would say that, that most churches, are their pulpits are dominated by hirelings. And the reason that they're hirelings is because the church is a business and they're the CEO. If they church growth. Um, mm -hmm. it's a church growth model, so you stay away from the things that are controversial, or the things that you don't understand, or the things that don't fit your platform, which is really not an expositional way through this through the text. I can guarantee you, you'd find out the ones that would no longer be hirelings if you made them study the Bible and teach all the way through it. They would start to learn eschatology, and they would become very much as as we are in their view of eschatology and the rapture. Because really, as I think we've hopefully been able to demonstrate, the uh, the text is pretty clear on on what we're looking at. There's not a lot of speculation. There is one view that fits the entirety of the scripture, rather than a verse here and a verse there. So if if uh, churches were um, concerned primarily over the pulpit with teaching and learning all the way through the scriptures, it would force the pastors to teach because they've learned it first themselves. And they would have to rethink pretty much most all of what they do. So you don't believe in your best life now? <laughs> no. I, who, was it, who was it that said, somebody had said, if, if this is your best life now, you have no, no intention of going to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that, that's yeah. good, man. Uh, that's good. <laughs> well, I, I think it comes down to, if I can be as simple and as practical as possible, but. I think everything comes down to simple trust in God's word or else not. Because um, I, I thought it was really interesting that you had mentioned your talks with R.C. Sproul. Um, I remember listening to R.C. Sproul many, many years ago, um, especially when he came out with his series on the holiness of God. I think that was kind of what catapulted him into the... Into the, um, the full Christian uh, and, uh, visibility, you know, thing. And, uh, and, and it, was, it was very powerful, powerful messages. But then, you know, you began to realize, you know, that uh, he was, was very, very reformed, especially in his eschatology, uh, end time position. A a anyway, uh, I'm not trying to focus on R.C. Sproul as much as I am on what people believe about the word of God. Because I know that he knew that there was a rapture, uh, uh, you know. Right. Yeah. So, but in 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 the in 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 the church, there's there's 
if, if we don't stay faithful to teaching the word of God from Genesis to Revelation and teaching it as, as it is God's word, and we believe that God's word is true, then I can believe that if God created the world in six 24-hour days, that he can come and pull us out of here. That's just nothing to God. But some people will kind of theoretically believe in the word of God, say it, but then something like this comes up, and what is the first thing that they say? I can't believe it. But we should believe it, because God said he would. You know, so it's a simple matter of faith in, in many cases. I'm not, I'm, trying not to be, I'm not trying not to be theological here, but... It's a simple matter that we've talked to so many people that want to believe but don't. And in this particular case, it's too late to, to worry about the question. You have to believe this is happening now and something's going to happen. It's imminent because Jesus said it would. So what was the question? We have a, I mean, we've gotten a, a lot we, of great answers. We actually but, we, we do but, have... But largely, the, I think one of the things that, that Tommy said is, is really, really applicable in that, and we, we've all talked about this over the week, is when you teach through the Word of God, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, it forces you to share the full counsel of the Word of God, and it prevents you from being able to pick certain things and say that we're only going to talk about this. We're only going to talk about money. We're only going to talk about health. We're only going to talk about God's grace. We're only going to talk about this, that, or the other. You need the full counsel of the Word of God, and that has been a hallmark largely of Calvary chapels. I mean, as we said, not, not all Calvary chapels are perfect, and, and really no Calvary chapel is perfect because no church is perfect. But that is a great thing about Calvary in general is teaching the full counsel of the Word of God. And so you can't avoid things like the rapture. You can't avoid end times. You can't avoid anything. I talked to Chuck Smith one time about this. And do you know who influenced him? J. Vernon McGee. And he told me that every day he listened to a J. Vernon McGee tape. And this was just a few years before he died. So uh, that was the through the Bible you know, and so he 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 said uh, he started taking ten chapters and teaching through the Bible, and that, as you're saying, that keep keeps him in there. And so, if the Bible is your focus, not some social agenda and all of these other issues that people want to be relevant to, that equips the saints to be able to talk about anything in relation to the Bible. So that, that's why God blessed Calvary Chapels, I think. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's a great way to put it, is that, that it's not, when we talk about avoiding the social context and all these things, it's not that we're not going to talk about them, and it's right. not that, that it's not important. It's that our job as pastors is to equip the saints. And so to be equipped, to be able to face whatever's going on, not because we have all the answers, but because we are pointing people to the Word of God and to Jesus where all the answers can be found. And so, again, it's just that emphasis on teaching the Scriptures, learning the Scriptures, giving the full sense, and, and being able to, to then learn how to think critically and to apply it. So. Imagine Paul answering this question. We all know the passage about all Scripture is given, right? So right. 2 Timothy, at the end of chapter 3, it segues right into chapter 4, which we've all heard before, where he says, preach the word and be ready in season and out of season. That's only two verses later, actually three. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. That means not picking a topic here or there. So that's the standard, that's the, that's the objective, that's the ideal. And here's the reason for that. Because on the counter of that, the time is going to come when people will not endure sound doctrine, unlike what he's told Timothy to do. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they're going to see, they will heap to themselves teachers. They'll turn away their ears from the truth be turned to fables. That's the direct answer to the question. Why are teachers not doing it? They're teaching fables because people want to hear fables. Church growth movement uh, exactly. is one illustration. Uh, liberal, historic liberalism in the 1920s is another, but uh, they, 
church growth <laughs> movement is an effort uh, where they used marketing. And they, uh, for example, they went and studied the 10 most successful churches and they found what they did, you know, and, they, and so they tried to do that. And it's based on marketing principles rather than sitting down and studying the pastoral epistles, for example, to see what God wants us to do, you see. And so now the church growth churches, something like uh, 25% of them have gone under because of COVID. You know, they, they don't have people that wanted to go to church, you see, during it. And you see this in a lot of the Bible-believing churches where people started coming back to church even before the government says it's okay, you know, to do that. And, you know, but... Getting back to what, what you were saying about the last part of Paul's letter to Timothy, the second, second letter, you know, he's getting ready really to be executed. Right. And all of us as as pastors, um, we we have to we have to make a, a concerted decision, you know, that this is the life we are to live. You know, uh, Paul said, I, I am crucified with Christ. What is he saying? I'm dead. You know, and, and here he's telling Timothy, you know, as you were pointing out. From, from verse 16 of chapter 3 right into chapter 4, which is one of my favorite passages, but we know he's getting ready to be offered. And we understand, at least we want to be able to say that we understand Paul saying, I have fought the good fight. You know, is it a good fight if all we're doing is teaching pet doctrine? You know, there's no fight. Because everything about the Christian life is about life and death. And life. Life, death, and life. But we, uh, we, we, we tend to, as, as we've already mentioned, you know, prefer, as far as certain teachers, just prefer to stay on, on, on the earth rather than deal with what is coming, which right. is heaven. That's right. For the believer. So, just wanted to. Throw that in. Anything else to add before we? That was a big answer to a very short question. But <laughs> um, so this one is directed at, at all three of you. First um, John chapter two verses twenty two through twenty five, but specifically verse twenty three says that whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either, and he who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So is it of utter importance in these last days to make sure that we establish in conversations that the Father and the Son are believed together? And the question from this person said, personally, I keep this in the forefront. So in light of everything that's going on, is it of utter importance that we make sure to mention that it is belief in the Father and the Son? I guess the inference being not just in Jesus. I would say it depends on who you're talking to, what the subject is, and all of this kind of stuff. So, yeah, if someone is weak or shaky on the Trinity, in essence is what they're talking about, yeah, then you need to emphasize it because the Bible presents God as a triune being. And, of course, the one that we see, the second person of the Trinity, comes down and is incarnated. You know, God the Father... God, the Holy Spirit, or I like to use the term sheer bare deity. You know, they're not incarnated, even though they have roles, you know, in history. Uh, you know, God the Father is viewed as the planner, God the Son as the agent, and God the Holy Spirit as the empowering energy or whatever. I hate to, I shouldn't use the word energy. I hate that because that makes it impersonal. But he's the one that empowers things. I don't know if that answers their question or not. But. I think if we're going to be careful to minister using the word, the word's going to take care of the problem on its own because it's intertwined. Take them through chapter 7, chapter 8 of John. It's all throughout. Jesus is talking about there and in many other places. I'm not here doing things on my own. I'm here because the Father sent me. 
or for God so loved the world that he sent his son. Um, what was his answer to Philip? When Philip says, just show us the Father and it'll be enough. And he says, really? Have I been with you that long that you don't even know? So, again, like, like Tommy had said, it, it's going to depend if, if the, the discussion is going to be led that way and you're having a, a question asked of you or, or you're in, a, in some kind of a discussion with someone, if you're going to use the text, the text will be able to deal with what God wants dealt with. And so it's going to deal with Father, Son, Spirit, as Tommy had said. The triune God is all interwoven into the text, so you couldn't take it out if you wanted to. If something's not being emphasized properly, we're probably not dealing with the text properly. In fact, there are Jewish documents that indicate at least 200 years before the time of Christ, some Jews were figuring out the Trinity. And we have pre-Christian documents that vindicate that. Also, the early one of the things you learn from church history is what we call the progress of dogma. The church, you know, you have the Bible, but when you talk about the Bible, are you talking about it rightly or wrongly? You see what I'm saying? So you have to state these things, and you have the development of doctrine starting with scriptures and God, and God, the Father, and the Trinity is developed by the early church, you see, because they had to figure that out. Then you go on later in the 300s or so, uh, you begin to develop the doctrine of salvation. And actually, no one taught justification by faith alone in Christ alone until Martin Luther. 1,500 years. In fact, uh, the early church believed in... Uh, they had a wrong view of the person of Christ until Anselm came along in the year 1000, around in there, and stated uh, the, the correct view of who Christ was and stuff like that. And they, uh, the atonement, I'm sorry, the atonement. And uh, the church for many years believed in what's called the ransom to Satan theory, that the atonement was to pay Satan. That's just a crazy view. Some of the Word of Faith people teach that, by the way, even today. But it wasn't until around 1000 that Anselm stated this doctrine correctly. You see, so you have progress. And guess what? The last two areas to be developed in the flow of church history, you know, you can go back and they taught things on these issues right, you know, as early as you can go back. But to develop them in a systematic, full way were the issues of ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, and eschatology, the doctrine of last things. So you have to get, for example, for the rapture and all this to be understood, you have to get a right view of the church and then your eschatology. So that's why our view, known as dispensationalism, pre-tribulationalism, didn't become prominent in the church until the last 200, 300 years, you see. And that is basically... The, all the different areas of theology have been developed, and some say we're back to what the early church was involved in, and that is apologetics, waiting for Christ to return. And so, you know, that's where church history can help you understand uh, why things down through history, and even in our own day, uh, are happening in the way that they are. All right. Uh, the next one, and by the way, we have Zeke standing up here on the side. He's not just standing up here to hang out. So if you guys have questions that you would like asked here in the audience, you can raise your hand and Zeke will be making his way out to get those. So to Zeke, the microphone. We, yes, with yeah. the microphone. So we'll do one more here, but Zeke, uh, if you can head over there. Uh, so the next one, Pastor Chris, please elaborate on the fairly new term Christian nationalism and how it ties in with the decades-old errors within Christendom involving dominionism and similar teachings, such as seven mountains, declaring, prophesying, injecting themselves into conservative politics. You guys all remember when uh, Trump was, was running and after he had won, the people that were in the, in the uh, Oval Office with him praying over him, you guys see some of the pictures yes. of who was there? So Paula White was, uh, was one of them. A lot of people who believe, how many of you are familiar with the term the seven mountains? Seven mountains, dominionism. 
Um, those are parts around the culture, whether it's the media, whether it's politics, um, whether it's uh, societal, cultural things. These seven mountains, basically, the church needs to not only get involved, but they need to arrest away from the devil his power taking over those seven mountains. We know it's dominionism. So the dominion that was lost at Eden needs to be taken back by power with the church. So it's, it's birthed a, a group called the, the New Apostolic Reformation, the NAR. And these are people, if you, how many of you have heard of a guy named C. Peter Wagner? Okay, C. Peter Wagner. Um, he was the guy who coined the term, the New Apostolic Reformation. So he went as far as to say, which, you know, if, if, if judgment was as swift in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament as it was in the Old, I wouldn't want to be anywhere near him when he said it, but uh, <laughs> that there was going to be a whole new group of prophets and apostles with a greater mandate than the first. And they would be able to prophesy and they would be able to, you know, take back this authority. And they've been beating that drum since William Branham in the middle of, last, uh, of the last century. And frankly, they're getting, the things are going from bad to worse while they're telling us that they're decreeing this, that, and the other thing, and they're speaking reality. Hey, they're not sovereign. They can't speak anything into reality. So I don't care how much huffing and puffing they want to do and how much they want to say that they're, they're the anointed prophets and apostles. And they'll tell me that I'm attacking them by saying that, and that you're not supposed to touch God's anointed. I don't believe you're anointed. So I don't, I'm not worried about that. So I can just take a look at the stuff that you're decreeing and all your, your noise that you're making, and nothing's coming of it. So you've demonstrated you don't have an anointing, and only the sovereign can speak things into existence. If you could speak it into existence, you'd have to tell God to move over because you can make your own reality. So the churches should be addressing all of this and have things in their proper perspective. But um, people should know that there are those who believe as part of the, the Seven Mountains mandate and the, the NAR movement, dominionism, that somehow the next thing is that we're going to turn this nation back to a theocracy. That is the purest form of what some believe Christian nationalism would be. There is the middle road, I guess you could say, part of it that I would love to see a nation that had turned itself back to God and that it reflected in the public policy. I would love to see that. Some of us were very glad to see Roe being put back to the, the states. We thought that was great. Um, but the idea that, that the United States has ever been or ever would be a theocracy is just nonsense. The Bible doesn't say any such thing. But um, when it comes to the idea of Christian nationalism, let's just face it, that is a title that's been thrown out there to marginalize the church. Very few people in the church really want to see or think that there is some way that we, the church, will get so involved in politics that we're going to, by force, turn this into a Christian nation and a theocracy. The idea that it could ever get there is just, again, it's so, it's so fanciful and ridiculous. It's not what we're called to do. So um, the, the, I'll try to wrap that part of it up. To say that um, we are Christian nationalists because we would like to see our values reflected in the public sphere, it used to be that way the further that you go back with all of our troubles in our history, the, the Bible and the belief in God had a lot more to do with public policy. That has long since kind of left the, uh, the public discussion. So the idea of Christian nationalism, it is the, the, the movers and shakers in our world hate nationalism. By throwing the Christians in with nationalism, it's that much easier to marginalize us, the church, and try to get us to be lumped in with the crazy people thinking that we're going to take over everything. And there is that small element that, that exists. Yeah, in the mid to late 70s and early 80s, I was involved in something called the Christian Reconstruction Movement. And that's how I got into writing books. And I wrote a book talking about that because of my background in that. And uh, the Christian Reconstruction Movement, you know, was on the scene even before what he was talking about came on. And these were people who, who were post-millennial. They were covenant theology people, anti-Israel. And they believed uh, that, they still believe that God is going to take over Things. You're seeing this uh, Doug Wilson out of Idaho, if anybody's been exposed to him. He's an 
advocate of this. But uh, so I, my first book that I ever wrote, I wrote with a guy named Wayne House, who was a professor at Dallas Seminary. On you know, it was called Dominion Theology: Blessing or Curse, Noma Press, and we dealt with all of those uh, things in that book. And they, you know, it go and they hate dispensational premillennialism pre-trib. And you can go on the internet, and I have debates with me and Dave Hunt had debates with these guys and uh, stuff like that. Some as much as like 28 years ago, that, cool. that, that famous debate that we had, uh, you know, on this issue. On the John Ankerberg show, we had stuff like oh. that and all of that kind of stuff. It's past. And uh, so I was involved for a while in that, and you know, I finally realized I was heading in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, and then the, the follow-up, the second part to that question, um, also, isn't the political left calling the patriot Christians this term, the, calling us Christian nationalists, and using it as a smear and making it similar to making us out to be Nazis? Right. Um, and, and in a sense, um, they're saying, would you agree that the political left is really the group that's pushing their pagan, religious, or non-religious ideology onto the political system and then trying to say that we're the ones doing Definitely. that? Definitely. You know, it's a pot all in the kettle black, so to speak, as they say. They're, they're the ones that are closer to the Nazis than us and uh, things in it. You know, people try to go and talk about the Puritans and all this kind of stuff. Well, you know, the, the Puritans did not believe in uh, religious freedom. They did not because they were coming from Europe. And even as late as the 1820s, 1830s, states like Massachusetts had their state re religions. Virginia was the Episcopal Church. Massachusetts was the uh, Congregational Church, you see. And uh, this idea that you can't have uh, Christianity involved in the public life, you know, is totally wrong. But what it means is you can't have a state church like they had in Europe, you see, even though to some degree they did that in ver the various colonies, you know. Yeah, I think that one of the things that we've run into here at different times is the, the idea that you leave your Christianity in your church, and then when you go into politics, when you go into government, when you go into wherever it is, when you go outside of the Christian circle and you enter into the world, then you need to leave your Christianity behind. Right, exactly. And, and I, I just don't see how, how you can do that. You know, you, you can't compartmentalize that. If we really are what we say we are, children of God, and Bible-believing, then, then that should give us a biblical worldview, and therefore it influences everything else, not the other way around. Well, so. you look at the 1800s in Texas, you had to be a Catholic to live in Texas before 1836, you see. Uh, and so you had all of these Protestants moving in who said they were Catholics, but they weren't, you see. And that eventually led to the uh, Republic of Texas you know, defeating Mexico and separating from that. But they required that you had to be a Catholic to, to live in Texas, and uh, a lot of people didn't go for that. But you, you, had, you had those kinds of things coming out of the uh, Middle Ages, you know, and all these things. You had, christened, you had the world divided in the Middle Ages between Christendom, and it was a big lump of all the Christian nations, and Islam. And uh, there was a situation where in the uh, 800s, where what is today, uh, what's the country that's having the war? Poland, not Poland, but... Uh, Ukraine. Ukraine. Part of Ukraine converted to Judaism because they didn't want to be part of Islam or Christendom. You see what I'm saying? So they, for 150 years, were part of Judaism. And, uh, but... It ended with, you know, that kind of faded away, and it ended up with uh, the Muslims taking them over and wiping out everybody and everything like that. But So you see those kinds of things. And then you had the revival of, like in the Middle East, in the late 1700s, 
related to Napoleon of countries becoming separate from Christendom and becoming nations again, you know, in preparation, I believe, for the end time Bible prophecy, but nevertheless. What you see in our country, especially, I'd say, since the 70s, is the rise of the secular left running politics. So let's just be honest. It's, it's a matter of worldviews. Everybody has one, and they're going to want to see it implemented in policy. Right. Just it is what it is. So I, you just have to ask yourself, when was the last time you saw a political leftist get canceled? How about a political person that's on the right? That happens every day. So, yeah, they, I've, they doth protest too much, would be Mike saying to that. And as far as uh, uh, the idea that we should somehow leave our Christianity at the door, it's inseparable from who we are. We'd be living a lie if it was otherwise. So um, I don't, I'm, I'm one of those kind of people that's just like, I'm not going to engage in, in even the hypothetical that we should somehow bow out. That never used to be the case. The problem was that, that when, the ch when the church allowed itself to be silenced, that's when it started to go sideways. But again, is that we look at that and just go, oh, it's about right on time. Mm -hmm. The Lord's going to do this because I would think that one of the fastest ways to make us irrelevant on the world stage is to take away the power of the church and the nation. Well, in, my, in our book, Dominion Theology, I wrote a section in there about Holland, how Holland in the late 1800s, early 1900s was the most Christian nation in Europe. In fact, uh, they, they elected for six years a Christian minister uh, who was their prime minister. And what we then learned from Holland by World War II is they'd become se secular. And, and I argued that what you have when you have strong Christianity and it starts going south, the Paganism is set against Christianity. You follow what I'm saying? That's what we're seeing in the United States because of our tremendous Christian heritage. You see the most severe anti-Christianity that you have anywhere in the world. And that's what the left is doing, I think, in preparation for the Antichrist. But nevertheless, uh, that explains why you could go from our heritage, if you know our history, a tremendous you know, even, even Roosevelt in World War II had to nod to God. You know what I mean? There's still enough left in World War II. But, you know, with the post-World War II, you know, the, the beatniks and then the hippies and all of this kind of stuff has done so much to secularize our country. And that's why God sent a revival, the Jesus movement. And all those hippies <laughs> say, isn't God amazing? I think it is. You know, if I was a movie maker, I'd want to make a movie reenacting the Constitutional Convention and uh, have somebody stand up in there and say, I think that we should have not only a secular government, but we should kick God out of every facet of our society and watch all the founders laugh the guy out of the room. Because <laughs> right. that's how it would have gone down. Yeah. You know, they basically said without, without any kind of moral underpinnings, especially with this kind of a free society, we will ravage ourselves. My, my paraphrase of, of things that Madison had said and people like him said, John Adams said very similar things. But you read their writings and, and try, to, try to make the case from the writings of the founders that they wanted not only a secular society, but one wherein any kind of Christian um, belief and morality wouldn't have any part of public policy. The whole idea of that is just absurd on its face. Okay. Um, along those lines, before we get to one of the questions in the room, uh, Chris, do you discuss current events on any other platforms? And if you do, how do we find that? <laughs> Pretty much every time I get a chance. Um, mainly it's conferences. Uh, if it's in the text, I teach through the Bible online. So um, I, I put them up on our YouTube channel and on the website. And yeah, you can't avoid it. Sometimes there were things that were happening, especially in Israel, that really do mirror very much what was happening here. So their history is, has a lot of the same problems that ours does. And so I will address things happening in the culture if you can make an application from the text, leaving and preserving reading, leaving and, and preserving the history that you're reading. But in the application sense, if it's something like that, then yeah, I'll, I'll address it. And I do some topical things from time to time, plus conferences. Let me just say this. Uh, the organization that I'm director of is called the Pre-Trib Research Center. 
It's founded by Tim LaHaye and myself years ago. And we have scholars that come together every year and do hour and a half presentations. And we have other scholars that attend and they ask questions and all of this. The last 17 years we have on video. You can watch each. and We usually have about 10 or, tw 10 or 12 uh, sessions each year and you can watch them on video. We have hundreds of papers dealing with everything under the sun relating to Bible prophecy. And we also have a, on, on Monday nights in our second year, we, Hal Lindsey spoke, and when he finished speaking, everybody started asking him about contemporary events and current events. So we started having on Monday nights current events for like three hours, you know, where people talk about current events. We have all of those, how it interacts or relates to what's happening in Bible prophecy. So we have a very large website. It's at pre-trib.org. Pre, P R E hyphen trib, T R I B dot org, if you're interested. And I recommend it because of the number of articles you can Huge. read at any given time. And they're tremendous. All right. Uh, I think we have one question here in house. Yes, uh, Dr. Ice, Pastor Katana, Pastor Charlie, if, uh, all three of you are welcome to question. My question is pertaining to Israel as a people, as a nation, and in God's eyes. So myself, as a, as a believer, I believe that they've been protected by the Lord. That's why they have not been exterminated, per se, right. despite many efforts to do so. Now, in the, your travels that you all have had, whether it be to the Middle East or wherever around the globe, have you ever had a chance to carry on a conversation with a scholar or a, a political leader, let's say from Iran, for example? And what is their rationale for such a small nation as Israel with a small population in comparison, in comparison to the rest of the world? Why have they not been able to exterminate Israel like they desire to? No, I have not been able to talk to a Muslim leader about that. But I think generally uh, they, all, you know, they look at everything Muhammad did. And Muhammad failed the first time. He tried to take over Mecca or whatever, or was it Medina? I think he went from Medina to Mecca, yeah. And so uh, that they would, and they also believe that if a country has ever been under Islamic rule, then it has to return to Islamic rule. And they believe it will happen in the end of days, you see. And so uh, that is what drives them, the... You know, they never talk about this like on the news networks or anything like that. That somehow that's why you can't negotiate peace or have peace with them. You have to defeat them. That's what Benjamin Netanyahu, I saw him on TV this weekend, is going around saying that we cannot cut a deal uh, with these folks. You know, because they don't because of their overall system. But no, I've never talked to anybody like that. I've never had that conversation, but. You don't even need to go to the Middle East to, to find out that people have just a real unnatural hatred for Israel. And uh, there's only one answer to it. It's a spiritual answer. They don't even know why they hate them. They just hate them. It's propaganda on, it, to some extent, and it's just absolute spiritual blindness on the other side. Because, let's face it, if you're not a believer, who owns you? And boy, does he hate the Jews. So if you're his kid, you're going to hate him too. I don't know how easier to answer the question than just that. Um, why haven't they been able to do it? Because God has future plans with them. I mean, that's, that's about as easy as I can make that answer. Which is a tremendous tes testimony of God's love for Israel. I mean, to think that there they are surrounded by 80 million enemies and God has protected them. I'm trying to think of who I had the discussion with about Yad Vashem. And Yad Vashem is the Holocaust Museum in Israel. And as you walk through the display, as you zigzag your way through it, and it is devastating to look at, to, the, to your heart and mind. You walk out of that place, and you're absolutely drained. And when you walk out from it, you might not notice it unless it's pointed out to you, you walk out onto a really large platform before you exit, and what you're looking at is a whole bunch of villages out in the, on the countryside out in front of you. It was designed that way deliberately. 
because you've just walked through an entire exhibit of the most egregious in recent history of an attempt to eradicate the Jews. And after you've walked through that, and you're so numb from what you've watched because it's so hard to look at, you walk outside and it's God basically saying, that is awful as it was, this is what you see as your result. They're still very much here, they're very, very much alive, and they're thriving in the land, finally. It's devastatingly beautiful in its imagery. Yeah, I took a class about five years ago uh, at Yad Vashem. Spent two weeks there. And one of the things that we, and, and almost all of the teachers were people who survived the Holocaust. I could show you their numbers, you know, on them. And uh, they're almost all gone by now, though. But we were there for a night to honor Israel, which they have once a year. And we were on the second section on the front row. And a, a lady came up to me and said, my father survived uh, right at the end there at Auschwitz where they had this march uh, because the Germans, I mean the Russians I think were coming, they, they liberated Auschwitz. And they took all the prisoners and marched them without feeding them or anything. And her father survived that. And she, he want, she wanted him to sit on the front row, so I gave up my seat on the front row of that second section for him to sit there. We talked to them. They invited us. They'd moved to Israel. They originally went to New York City, and uh, they wanted us to come over for the Sabbath. That's what you do if you're Jewish people. You invite friends over to share Shabbat with them. And uh, he survived, and he said, Eric, we get back at the Nazis by having as many children as we can. And he had a lot of children. And he said, and Israel is the only country in the world that has above 4.0 average children. Most, almost every country I think now in the world is, is below 2.3, which is replacement, you know, thing. And so obviously the world leads to selfism, which leads to not wanting to have children, but the Jews are repopulating themselves in many ways. So along those same lines, uh, one of the questions that we had gotten, uh, Chris, in one of your studies, you mentioned that replacement theology is heresy, which is a very strong rebuke. Do you believe that those who are heretics or spreading heresies are still part of the body of Christ? And what should our response be to, to people that do have replacement theology? Do we not associate with them? Do we, wait, what would our, our stance be? Well, I'll defend the idea of calling them heretics. I mean, it's not personal. You're just calling God a liar. So I don't know what other label I would want to call them. So you're, you're taking the text to say something and making it say something that it doesn't say, which is really kind of just a, a textbook way of heresy. So trying to, trying to say that in all the repeated places that I actually I cited a number of them, but where God says that he's going to do it and he speaks of them as Israel and Judah regathered, there's no way you can make that fit the church. So I don't know what other word to use. Um, but as far as, as the person, I really don't have any kind of, uh, that I'm aware of, I don't have any kind of ongoing friendship with somebody who's into replacement theology because I just, what, what, what fellowship do I have with that? Uh, that's not one of those things I can look the other way on because you're basically calling God a liar. At, at that point. So, um, you know, I, there, the matter of salvation, all the rest of that, um, it's in the, the whole um, belief of uh, replacement theology, it's not like you're questioning the deity of Jesus. That's a salvation issue. If you want to tell me that Jesus is just a byproduct of relationships between man and woman, you, you reduce him to just humanity? Yeah, I have... I'm going to break fellowship with a person like that. I can, you know, be kind and cordial, but 
yeah, I'm not going to have much to do with them. Um, replacement theology, I just don't think that they'd like me a whole lot. <laughs> we probably wouldn't be all, all friendly. But, I thought um, everybody liked yeah. you. Huh? I thought everybody liked you. <laughs> yeah, until they come tell me that they're into replacement theology. <laughs> uh, but as, again, I don't want to belabor it too much. Um, when, when there is something that's being taught that is so blatantly unbiblical, and, and even worse, when, you're, when you have something that's so demonstrably untrue, so as to say the promises that God made are null and void because of the way that you're reading the text, I just don't know how else to say it other than it is heresy and people who would advocate for it even when they're corrected on it and still run headlong into that, that uh, belief. It is heresy. Was Martin Luther a believer? Was, oh, yeah, because he was a... Yeah, I know. That's, he was into I mean, he's the guy that restored the gospel to the Protestant church. And yeah. a few years before his death, he turned against the Jews because he thought that Protestantism would be something they would welcome. And he wrote a book called Against the Jews and Their Lies. Hitler quoted him three times in Mein Kampf. But Luther was certainly a believer. So you can be really messed up in that area. And, you know, I have a number of Christian friends that are replacement theology people. And, you know, it, it started in the 300s in the early church. You have actually the late 200s. You have a guy named Chrysostom. He's called the, the greatest preacher in the early church. And he, he did an eight-sermon series against the Jews. And he kind of ends his sermon by saying, if hating Jews makes you a good Christian, we're all good Christians. You know, and that kind of stuff. And it's just terrible stuff reading that, that stuff. But I think, and, and I, this doesn't justify it, but I think if, the, if Christianity and Christendom had not been so anti-Jewish, the Jews would not have remained a separate people. You follow? In other words, that was one of the outcomes. And it wasn't until the late 1700s with the rise of the Enlightenment that Jews got outside their own communities and got involved in Europe and various places you know, and, and with philosophy and all this other kind of stuff. But the Jews, for at least the first 1,500 years or so, remained in their own communities and maintained the Jews. And there's never been a people group that have left their country and maintained their ethnic identity outside that country and have now come back, except for Israel, another miracle by, the, by our Lord. And I'm not justifying that stuff in the Middle Ages at all, but I'm saying probably that was the means that led to them maintaining their identity as Jewish people. You're going to also find that people that hold to really rigid, if they understand what they mean when they believe, uh, if they hold a replacement theology, then everything that we've been talking about in this yeah. conference, oh, yeah. they're going to be on the other side of it. And right. I, there's a saying, I just love it, it's that bad eschatology leads to bad doctrine. And so if, if, they're, if they think somehow that the church has replaced Israel, that's the beginning of their problems. But if you start to pick through all of their, their doctrine and the theological views on a number of things, you'd find out that's just one of many things that you'd have some serious, serious problems with. Uh, I think we have a question in the audience. Yes, um, I was just thinking about when you were talking about not too many people go on the mission field anymore. And then I was thinking about how they've got open borders right now, how we really don't like that. I mean, we like to feel safe, but what if the Lord has allowed that right now so that we can be witnesses in the Great Commission? And some of us will do that. And I wondered if you had a word on... Uh, if you could light a fire under all of us about what woke is in the church, in some of these churches that are not really sharing the gospel and about sin and things like that right now. Yeah, woke is simply a form of liberalism, which is, you know, anti-Christianity. 
Here, here's an illustration of the first part of your question. Um, the Irish from Ireland come, and they're, they were 90% Catholic when they came to the United States. And uh, that started in the mid-1800s. Well, they, I saw a study done about 20 years ago. Guess what? Most Irish Americans are Protestants. So what did that mean? It meant all of those Catholic Irish that came, so many of them, a majority of them, you know, become Protestants or at least get saved. You see what I'm saying? And I think God brings a lot of different people group to the United States of America, at least in the past, and uh, they, a lot of them get saved. And that could ha that's what you're, I think you're implying, that this is an opportunity for the gospel for a lot of these people that are coming in illegally to be evangelized. Yes, and I think that's a, a good point. I'm going to try not to be cynical. <laughs> I think that the mission field really, we need to send missionaries into the church. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know how else to say it. I, I think that the church needs to even know how to articulate the gospel. So for the most part, it's going to be hard to engage people that would be coming here when most of the population is completely secular as well. They may call themselves, I mean, I'll get a little political here. Um, when I heard Nancy Pelosi say that she's a good Catholic, no, she isn't. She, she's an absolute rebel against her professed faith. So you can call yourself anything you want to. It doesn't make it so. Um, as far as the church is concerned, again, missionaries need to be sent there so that they can understand what the gospel is. And then we would have the sufficient numbers of people to go out and start meeting the needs of, of a population that, what are we, about 350 million people in the country? Um, what, what almost undetectable fraction of those people are actually saved. So our mission field is for people that have been here their whole lives as well as anybody that might be coming in brand new. We should have compassion on whoever is in front of us, no matter where they came from, legal or illegal. Um, but ultimately, the, the, there's just not that many people. I, I think about what Jesus said when he goes, look, you know, look at the harvest, but where are the, where are the laborers for the harvest? Because it's ripe, it's right there. Nothing has changed since he said that 2,000 years ago. There's a huge mission field right here in front of us from whether or not it's, it's people new to the country or, or people have been here all along, but I think kind of their, the church really needs a lot of people being sent to it with the gospel. Is that cynical enough? <laughs> all right, uh, our next question uh, from the internet. Dr. Ice, you referred to Gog and Magog happening prior to the tribulation? Was this a mix on words? And if not, why do you believe that? Well, I believe it because of... Uh, see, why do I believe that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe it because it's a regional attack and uh, they have to bury... You know, it talks about something... Uh, get rid of the instruments for seven years. And that's why I think it could happen as much as three and a half years before the uh, midpoint of the tribulation because Israel leaves the land at the midpoint of the tribulation. And so I think you could have the rapture, but I don't think it's going to happen before the rapture because we're still in the church age. And so prophecy is not going to be fulfilled in that way until after the rapture. So that is the basis for having a theory that uh, there could be as much as three, at least three and a half years between the rapture and the start of the tribulation to have some of these uh, prophetic events that start unfolding. And I believe when you contrast uh, Gog and Magog, it's... a uh, a regional attack to destroy Israel, and it fails. And I think that's the logic for Armageddon at the end. In other words, they tried it. Now we need the whole world to come and go after Israel at Armageddon, and then we can get rid of those pesky Jews, you see. So that's basically the idea, because it talks about seven years to... Uh, 
I, I get mixed up. Bury the dead is seven months and seven years. They they get the to energy. burn the instrument right. to burn, burn the, the, the things. Yeah, right. seven years. So that's the logic. Um, along those lines. By the way, one, one quick. If and, and we saw we saw this when I was here. I forget who pointed this out, but this is the big thing in Orthodox Judaism in their eschatology, their view of prophecy, is Gog and Magog. Oh, I, I don't know what it was. I saw uh, Netanyahu talking about it on the TV. That's where I was in my room <laughs> when I saw him uh, after the conference one night. And the, the Orthodox Jews in Israel and Israel as a whole believes that Russia's going to attack them. And that's widely, that is their view of eschatology or prophecy is we're coming back to the land. Russia's going to attack us with the Arab world, which I think is why the Arabs are, that's going to lead to them not being a global force and why it's going to return to Europe. And you have the revived Roman Empire. And so Gog and Magog, in my opinion, serves uh, to set the stage in that way for the end times. I'm a little encouraged by that, by the way, because for the most part, for the almost as long as I can remember, you'll usually hear that, that Jews will only be studying Torah. But if they're starting to talk about Mag Gog and Magog, that means that they're starting to read the prophets. Oh, and yeah. that is good news, man. I, I've talked That's to Orthodox news. Jews in the airport about this. And, uh, for example, I, I like to ask them about Daniel chapter 9. And many of them have told me that, that rabbis won't let them study Yep. Look at Daniel. Yeah, or Isaiah. I've had that at least five or six different Orthodox Jews tell me that over the years. I've heard Isaiah fifty three is like oh yeah, that's like a minefield. They won't let you walk close to it. Okay, so along those lines, uh, one of the other questions before we get to one in the audience: Why won't the seven year tribulation start right after the rapture, and how long do you believe that gap will be? Well, I've already answered that first second part. Uh, because you have to have the sequence of the ten nation confederacy arising and three of them being militarily taken over and it says then then the little horn which is a reference to the antichrist pops up out of the ten nation confederacy you see so the, the within the normal development of history that takes time and that's just one illustration of why you can't have the rapture and, and on the day of the rapture or the next day of the tribulation begins because you have to have, because God is doing what? He's restraining evil. He's restraining the uh, development of these things uh, during the church age. And so the church has to be removed that restraint against the rise of global, the type of globalism that's talked about there and all of these other things are not going to reach a certain level uh, while the church is still here. And so therefore, after the church is gone, you need time for that. And I'm sure there's other similar type developments that have to take place in order to get to the position where the revived Roman Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel. And, and let me just emphasize, that doesn't mean Israel accepts him as their uh, savior or anything. They just make a, an agreement. And then um, the follow-up, or part two to that, do you have a list uh, on your website or anywhere that lays out some of the things that have specific time frames uh, regarding prophecy and some of the things that are going to happen, but we just don't have more specific... We, we have a lecture by Arnold Frichtenbaum on our website that he gave on the sequences of these events. Okay. And I would recommend look up Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and uh, it's a video presentation along with his paper. You have both, and uh, he lays that out really well. Okay. A Jewish believer who was born in a Russian concentration camp in uh, 1946. <laughs> All right, from the audience, we have a question over here. In um, I received a text with a question, and they want you to answer uh, after the 10,000 uh, years, of, uh, why is Satan loosed again? 
After the, the, the 10,000 years, uh, why is Satan going to be released again? Yeah. Why is he loosed at the end of the millennium? Well, that, that's after 1,000. Yes, yeah, 1,000 years. 1,000. Uh, because it sh- it, it, one of the things it does, because the false prophet and antichrist are cast directly in the lake of fire, the first people to be cast there, and all unbelievers have been, I, I use the illustration that, you know, uh, when people die in unbelief, they go to the county jail. And then when they're convicted, they have their trial at the Great White Throne Job, but then they're sent to the penitentiary, to Huntsville. <laughs> and uh, that, so that's where they're going to spend all eternity. But nobody's there right now, but they will be. Okay, the thing about, what was the other thing? So why, why would God allow, or why is Satan going to be released? At the okay, end of because sa- Satan plays a role of like an amplifier of causing rebellion against God to really expand and and be influential. And apparently, Christ sitting on his throne in Jerusalem, individuals don't have the courage who are not believers, who are born, uh, you know, during the millennium, to rebel against God. And Satan comes along and somehow provides a attraction uh, for unbelievers to come up and do something stupid. I, I know my post, one of my post millennial friends said in a debate that we had, you know, you ought to be crazy to think people are going to, you know, want to go to Jerusalem, you know, and attack, you know, Christ who's resurrected there on his throne in Jerusalem. And I said, yeah, that's right. You got to be crazy. Mm-hmm. Sin makes you crazy, and it's going to be the last thing. Instead of taking seven years to get rid of him, God instantly, you know, brings lightning down from heaven and destroys him, and sends him to the lake of fire. And as well as then you have the trial of all the unbelievers down through history, and they're cast in to the lake of fire. And that seems to be the scenario, you know, that we have there in Scripture. There's a, a, a really funny thing I heard said once before because the idea that he is bound for those thousand years and you will know that he's been bound, you will know that he's been bound because at the end of that thousand years everything changes. So for those people who believe in a you know, that we're in the, the millennium now, the question was, Well, if we're in the millennium, I'd like to have a word with the management. <laughs> 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 because it shouldn't be like it is that, that he's bound and, and the and follow up joke too is that's a yeah. long chain. And so, that's what amillennialism and postmillennialism teach. Precisely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know that we're getting kind of late here, so just have a couple of hopefully shorter questions. Um, the first one... Shorter questions or shorter answers? Well, <laughs> I can only control half of that. Um, do you have a favorite Bible translation, and what is your position regarding the more modern translations than the KJV? Well, I, I personally don't prefer the KJV. I like the New American Standard, which I think is the most literal translation. And uh, you have a spectrum of approaches to translation. You have literal word-for-word, thought-for-thought translations, which to some degree the King James is and the New American Standard is. And uh, for example, uh, you have the phrase in Romans 1.8, born of the seed of David. Okay, that's a literal rendering of the words in the original language. Like the Living Bible, or even the NIV, translates it, a descendant of David. So what they've done by giving what they consider a freer translation, that's not an inaccurate translation, but it doesn't preserve, for Bible study, uh, it doesn't help you with uh, the original text, because the, the seed is an important thing you can trace throughout Scripture, you see? So that's why I prefer things like the New American Standard for me personally. And the Living Bible and all of that, those are paraphrases, and they're, they're terrible. I, ha- I still have some Living Bibles left. I guess I ought to throw them away. But, uh, but what's that one 
That's really, really bad. I don't even the have message. it in my, in my bi- the message. The voice I don't even have weird. it in my section of Bibles. No, no. It is just absolutely ridiculous. I don't now, think... now that I've offended everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris? paraphrases are just to be, uh, it's like you almost think that that's, ex- just call them extra biblical. <laughs> um, there's nothing more you can say about those. They're just a joke. Um, but I, actually, if you're going to do it, you can, you can find problems in every translation. You'll find right. something that somebody will be able to point out and say, this is not accurate. So, you know, uh, some people, that's a hill that they'll die on. I'm not one of them. Because uh, I, I don't think that you can so corrupt. See, I, what I have right here in front of me is a New King James. Uh, you can give me an NASB. That's, you can a, give that's me, the same as New American Standard and Philosophy. Right. Yeah, so you can put those in front of me, and I'm not going to have any problems proving the, the things that, that lead to salvation. So, um, uh, yeah, I just, I don't get into the, what you had mentioned about King James and what he was like on a personal level. He was a homosexual. <laughs> That's why that, the word homosexual does not appear in the King James Bible. They have all kinds of other words to translate that Greek phrase. But, you know, you, you have... Uh, Goodness, I forgot what I was going to say. Go ahead. <laughs> Short answers, right? Short answer. All right. Um, the spirits of the prophets. What? Are, who are they? What are they? What? The spirits, spirits of the prophets, prophets. say. Oh, so the in spirit. 1 Corinthians 14. Um, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So the in 1 are... Corinthians 14. Yes. Yeah. I'll let you answer that. <sighs> yeah. For the pastor. Um, Gosh, how do you say this quickly? We're, we're wanting brief answers, right? Well, um, I mean, if, it, if you feel like it would be a bigger answer, uh, we can definitely take that and, and we can get that to that person. Yeah, it's... Um, God would task prophets... I'm just trying to think of how many different ways we want to go at this. Let's make it the, the easiest of the answers as far as uh, the Spirit and, and what we know of the gifts as it's, as it's spoken is oftentimes you'll find people that will say, oh, I have this gift or I have that gift. As I read that, those texts, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, they are used, God will use who he wants, when he wants, how he wants. And it's not that one person is necessarily tasked at all times and they can do things at will. But it's also not one of those situations where the person is is just taken over like we're thinking possession kind of a situation and God just makes him do all kinds of things. It has to be a willing you know, a willing vessel, and he'll use them, though, when it comes to people being Bible teachers. That's something that you notice that God uses them in that capacity on a normal basis, if they're genuinely gifted by God. And you can say that they have the gift of teaching and they operate in that gift because God gives them the ability to do it. But it's not because of them. The Spirit gives them that ability to do the thing, but they're also the willing recipient of that gift to exercise that gift. So that's the most brief way that I could answer that. Charlie? Well, it's interesting that it, uh, it's followed by this statement, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches, saints. This is from my little King James Bible here. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, uh, books like Ecclesiastes and stuff we're not translated from Hebrew in the King James. They're translated from the, the Septuagint Greek text. Uh, but why did I say that? I don't know, but another topic for another time. It's a great, it's a great conversation. Um, okay, regarding the rapture, can someone give some explanation on what the incorruptible body or putting on immortality mean? The resurrection body you know, that we're going to have for all eternity. Yeah. Anybody wants to know whether or not you have a corrupt body? Take a look at yourself in pictures 15 years ago and compare it now. <laughs> and that body is not meant to live forever. Any other questions? <laughs> so we are decaying, and we are decaying from the moment that we are born. These bodies, flesh and blood, will not inherit the kingdom. Why? Because these bodies are not meant to live forever. Right? So, again, if that's a, a theory you want to put to the test... Take a picture of yourself right now and take a look at it in a year. All right. And then uh, our last question, 
Um, as an adult and, and a true lover of God's Word, many of us have young children and teens that, due to so many different aspects of life, will not actually sit and listen to something like this conference without losing focus. What would you recommend out there that can edify them and is biblically based? Uh, the, the author of the question says, I know many websites and online ministries that are coming out like hegetsus.com that are targeted to them that can water down the gospel and become very popular and lead them astray. So, Well, I, I think in general with children, you ought to teach them the stories in the Bible because they don't yet are of the age to understand theology and all that. As they become teenagers, having learned the stories of the Bible, then you start giving them the theology of the Bible and challenging them and do that by interacting with what's going on in their lives. As a general, that's a general short answer. <laughs> I think we want to be able to tell our kids from the earliest age why it's important that they should want to know these things. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be their own choice. So I remember having a number of conversations with my daughter, you know, during her adolescence and everything else and said, you know, you've been given every conceivable benefit. But I'll be honest with you, I'm concerned about choices that you may make because of the friends that you hang around with. And I didn't have any problem saying that. Some people would think you're a horrible parent for being that honest with your kid. It's like, what? How can I not be? You know, if, if I really believe that she is of the same belief that I am, then she should want to have the same interests that I do because they're biblical interests. I don't think that we should have to, you know, kind of capitulate to the, the way that the culture wants to raise our kids. I think if we teach our, train up our children in the way that they ought to go, when you see that training up, that, that uh, simply means that you've created an atmosphere in your home that's conducive to that. So... Man, I want to tell my, my daughter's believed in the rapture since as long as she could even grasp it. So that when time went by, it would still be of importance. But there's got to be a lot of cultivating of that along the way. Because they're always going to be bombarded by a world that tells them what you think is crazy. Uh, don't let them believe that it's crazy. Yeah. You know, let them know that, the, look, the, the church is a remnant, always has been, and it will be more so as time goes by. So, uh, again, I, I, I just... I'm not willing, I hate the idea of ceding ground to the enemy. I hate that. So, you know, it, let's make it important to them as early as they can possibly be and cultivate that along the way so that they really would want to be in something like this. It used to be that way. Kids were much more involved around church than they are now. But we keep making it too easy for them. And like you say, the watering down of things. Tell them the reasons why they should hate that. If you're going to give them a reason and say you shouldn't believe that, tell them why they shouldn't believe that. Give them a reason. Yeah, and I, I, as a father of four kids, we're ranging all the way from six all the way up to 12. One of the things that, that I've seen that has been very, very helpful for them is giving them the opportunity. Sometimes we expect things like this to be too far above their level. And I, I know me personally, there are times that I would borderline be upset at, at the oldest two for not paying attention or not taking notes or not getting anything. But the reality is that they were sitting there and even as they were doodling and they were doing other things, that there are things that they were picking up. And then they would ask questions later about things that had come up. And so encouraging them to, to sit through things like this and that if they have questions to ask you. And I, I was sharing with some of these guys earlier I've, I've taught all different variety of ages. I've taught college, I've taught high school, junior high, I've taught in adult ministries. But the single most difficult Bible study that I ever gave was a 15-minute chapel service for four-year-olds. Try taking a, a, any kind of Bible topic that is not a Bible story and simplifying it for a group of four-year-olds and holding their attention for 15 minutes. I mean, it is a challenge. But it was such a blessing because for me, it made me think about how simple so many things are that we overcomplicate. And, and so I would encourage all of you that are parents to give them the opportunity to sit in something like this. Give them the opportunity to ask you questions and to have those conversations. And ask your kids questions. 
You know, it, it's a great thing. We have a wonderful children's ministry. There are many other churches out there that have wonderful children's ministries in junior high and high school where they are actually learning about the Word of God. Ask your kids, what did you learn today? And have a conversation about that. And you would be surprised if you can get past the, well, what would you learn today, Jesus? If you can get past the initial answer, you would be surprised at how much they actually know and how much they're actually paying attention. Yeah, parents, the family's responsible for your spiritual development of children, sure. not the church. The church can help. And there are plenty of aids, Tri uh, spray bottles, prods, any <laughs> number of things like that to get their attention. Uh, Sean uses those, that's but, why I'm bringing it up. I thought it was very forward thinking. Full disclosure, so. they were used on Chris, not on my children. <laughs> <laughs> Before I was even saved, man, they were used. <laughs> All right, I've got to kind of start closing this up with, with a little bit of a testimony. Uh, when we started the church many, many years ago, we went from house meetings to small little buildings and kind of increased as, as the church grew. Along the way, a couple of little boys would be sitting in the congregation. One's name was Sam, the other was Sean. And uh, they would sit there, and they were actually writing notes down. Uh, this was the tremendous and blessed influence of their dad, Pastor, Pastor James. But uh, they, they were there. Now, of course, you know, they grew up like boys and did the boy thing and all of the teen thing and, and whatnot. But they were taught the Word of God to live it, to breathe it. In the days of cassettes, which is a museum piece now, <laughs> <laughs> they had a a cassette player. I don't remember what the name of that was. Colby the Robot. Which one? Colby the Christian Col Robot. Colby the Christian Robot. <laughs> and they would put on my cassettes and listen to them at night. So they could go to sleep. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was probably the reason. But the fact, the fact of the matter is is that Colby was actually a face, a digital face. Oh, okay. On the, on the, on the, they had a screen with his face. And so as I was talking, it was, <laughs> you know, so. I, I was uh, also hoping that both Sam and Sean on, on our little off times would teach me how to play uh, digital games. <laughs> and, and they did. But they always taught me to lose. <laughs> that is not entirely true. I taught him how to play, just not well enough to beat me. I didn't teach him to lose. I just didn't teach him to beat me. So from that point to today, what do we see? A couple of young men that love Jesus and love the Word of God and teach it very well. And God has blessed us here. And I'm thankful. In any event, uh, there may be 5,000 questions left, but we're all tired. <laughs> I think you probably can see it on our faces. But we're very happy, and we're blessed. And we've been blessed by your ministry. Tommy. Thank, thanks for inviting and me. Chris. Oh, you're, and you're always welcome. And Chris... You're always welcome. <laughs> and Bruce, get up here. <laughs> let's, all, let's all stand, because we, we got to stand too. So. We're all going to sing something together as we prepare to close out our... I better turn my mic off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't... All right. But we want the glory to come down, don't we? <laughs> All right. Hello? I would think this would be a very appropriate song to end this conference with. So let's sing it with all our heart. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. Give thee peace. Shalom. Have a, have a blessed, blessed week. As it comes, I want to thank Tommy and Janice for being with us here this week. And uh, uh, I don't know if the table's still out there. If you haven't ordered your, uh, uh, your books, uh, it's kind of like a pre-order, not so pre, but something like that. But when it comes in, you'll have the books, and we'll let you know about that. Okay, that'll be out in the back. And there, you, got, you guys got. It? We are back here. Nikki, Nikki's back there now, and and we're blessed to have you and Nikki with us. Praise the Lord. And Chris, of course, he just lit, he's he's just part of his part of us here. Thank you all for sticking with us and. Uh, have a, have a blessed week and uh, keep looking up because your redemption draweth nigh. Jesus is coming. God bless you.